Welcome to the Spencer Research Library at the University of Kansas and to a special exhibit which we are calling To the Great Variety of Readers celebrating the 400th anniversary of Shakespeare's first folio. I'm David Bergeron, Professor Emeritus of English at the University of Kansas. I'm curator of this exhibit along with the excellent help of Beth Whitaker, director of the Spencer Library. The exhibit opened officially on September 21st, 2023. One of the questions that comes up is why are we having this particular exhibit? What is the importance of the anniversary of the first folio and what is the first folio? I want to enumerate at least three different reasons for this celebration. First, the folio made literary history when it was published in 1623. The folio volume contains 36 plays, half of which had never been published in Shakespeare's lifetime. Therefore, we would be missing plays like Macbeth, Julius Caesar, Twelfth Night, The Tempest, The Winter's Tale, etc. And we would be thereby impoverished in our understanding of Shakespeare and his work. So it's, it's a remarkable thing that seven years after Shakespeare's death, we finally get a collection of his plays. And that's what the first folio is. And there'd been nothing quite like it before then. Uh, th that is a folio which contains only plays. So it's remarkable in that regard. And the folio helped establish Shakespeare's status and reputation um, throughout the world, as it turns out. The second thing is that it made printing history. Again, there was nothing like it before that, that contained only plays that had been performed in professional theaters. This was a very complex printing operation. It took place in the shop of William Jaggard with his son Isaac Jaggard and numerous compositors and presses, but it took two years of laborious effort to get the folio finished as the compositor setting metal piece of type by metal piece of type. There were numerous interruptions, delays, because this was an extremely busy, prominent shop. So some things took precedence over the first folio. The shop eventually turned out, we estimate, somewhere between 750 and 1,000 copies. 235 of those copies we know of today around the world. The largest collection is in the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., which contains 82 copies of the first folio. No other library or museum comes close to that. And this was the result of the determination of Henry Folger and his wife, Emily, and their obsession, <laughs> their determination <laughs> to gather as many folios as they could. And when they had done that, they made this a gift to the United States and endowed a library which is on Capitol Hill and is currently finishing a major renovation project. And when it reopens next year, uh, the 82 folios will be on public view for the first time. This is an expensive and risky undertaking for a printer. Two years of labor and then finally on the 8th of November, Isaac Jaggard and Edward Blunt went to the stationer's hall nearby to register this volume. William Jaggard unfortunately had died shortly before the folio was finished. Edward Blunt was himself a bookseller, stationer. He was in a sense the publisher of this volume and had arranged the financing, which was very tricky to do. On the 5th of December, we get a record of the first purchase of the folio by Sir Edward Daring, who was a 25-year-old, who was an avid book collector, and he had a copious accounting of all of his expenditures. That's how we know. And he bought two copies of the folio that morning at the cost of two pounds. Uh, we might ask uh, the obvious question, what is a folio? And a folio is referring to the format of the book. And a folio is, to, the term derives from the Latin term, and it simply means leaf. And so the folio size depends on what is the size of the sheet of paper that's gonna be used for printing. So if we take the sheet of paper and fold it in half, we have a folio, which is two leaves 
and four printing surfaces. So it's no more complicated than that. Most plays during the period, almost all of the plays, were in the quarto format, which means the sheet has been folded yet again. So to come to a folio is extraordinary and nothing much like that before then. The last uh, reason I would say this folio is so important is cultural, and that is because it was two actors, John Hemming and Henry Condell, who decided to put together this collection, and that in itself is extraordinary. They were personal friends, very dear friends of Shakespeare himself. He le left gifts for them in his will, um, and they had acted with him in the King's men, company, acting company, which was Shakespeare's company. So there was a lot of interplay, a lot of relationship, and these actors realized that the plays had not been gathered together. Um, so they set out. They had to find manuscripts, scribal copies, early printings, whatever, to bring this all together. And it's a remarkable achievement on their part. And they make clear to us that they did this to honor their friend, and to preserve. This is a great act of preservation and conservation. And nowhere else in our history, before or since, do we have any evidence of actors putting together such a collection of plays. But we have the death of Shakespeare in 1616, and we have the publication of Ben Jonson's folio of plays and poems in that year, which we will see in one of the exhibition cases. And then in 1619, Richard Burbage died. He was the greatest actor of the age, the one for whom Shakespeare wrote most of his leading roles. And you can imagine that uh, Hemming and Condell began to realize that <laughs> time was slipping by, and if they're gonna to put together Shakespeare's plays, and in a sense establish a canon of his works, it needed to be done. And therefore they got busy and went to William Jaggard and began the whole process of printing. And now we can look at, at some of the exhibition cases. Case one is about the precursors for the Shakespeare folio. And I call our attention to the folio in 1616 of the works of Benjamin Johnson. The Spencer Library has four copies of this folio and two of which are on display. And it's a remarkable title page, very ornate, which Johnson is trying to um, show how he is related to the classical world. Johnson was an extremely ambitious writer. He was a rival of Shakespeare, but also a very good friend. And we know that in part from what he writes in the first folio. So he calls it the works of Benjamin Johnson, and he took a good bit of criticism for that, because these are mere plays, after all, plus his poems. Because folios had been largely restricted to works of history, philosophy, religion, natural history, what we might regard as the important subjects. So to call it works, uh, and it must have been Johnson's way of trying to announce himself. He was an extremely ambitious writer. Uh, so we have his collection. This is the interim because after 1616, he wrote for another almost two decades. So it is not a complete collection as the Shakespeare one is. We see over here in the catalog, or the, what would be the contents of the folio, a list of all the plays that are in the folio. And then on the right-hand side, the persons to whom J Johnson is dedicating plays. And he starts with William Camden, who was Johnson's teacher. And he ends up with the Earl of Pembroke, who is William Herbert, who was Lord Chamberlain, and had oversight of all the activities of the theaters and publications of the plays. And his text of Sejanus, he dedicates to Esme Stewart, um, one of the outstanding courtier, courtiers in the Jacobean court. And in fact, Johnson lived in Esme's house for at least five years. So there's a close relationship that Johnson's trying to honor. So uh, the plays are being dedicated basically to aristocrats, and that is Johnson's own sort of ambition of status. We have a dedication here to Lady Mary Roth, 
who was the niece of Sir Philip Sidney. She was a poet in her own right. She was the first woman to write a sonnet sequence. Johnson was a great admirer of her and her accomplishments. The other folio in this particular case is not a poetic or literary one, but it is the works of King James. Uh, we see this magnificent title page here. Cross, we see the Simon Van Pass engraving of King James holding the arm and scepter, which we might have most recently seen in the coronation of King Charles III. That's a great portrait, 1616. So here's a kind of folio that we might expect to find because it includes, as we see in the contents page, a list of all the treatises that are in this book. No monarch before King James I of England had achieved such status as a writer. He was universally recognized as a serious writer. Uh, all kinds of tracts. He, he wrote against the use of tobacco. He wrote against <laughs> all sorts of topics. And he wrote Basilican Doran, which was designed to be a kind of guidebook for his son, Prince Henry, who would be, he hoped, his successor. So we see there even religious tracts that he had. King James also, when he was in Scotland, uh, published two volumes of poetry. No monarch before or since has done that kind of writing. This case takes us to a very peculiar sort of economic cultural phenomenon, that is the selling of parts of the folio. These were either damaged ones or ones that somebody just took apart in order to sell it. And the Spencer Library has here its only portion of the first folio, and that is the last three tragedies, Othello, uh, Lear, and Anthony Cleopatra. So we do have at least this example, and you'll see how it's laid out, the double columns, which is a very technically difficult thing for a printer to do. The other are, are examples of the second folio, which we'll talk about later, but these are examples of pieces of the folio that the library was able to acquire. Uh, particularly interesting here at the end of the second part of Henry IV, which looks like the end, it says fini, but then across the page in totally different font and design is the epilogue. This says something about the variety of the type font and, and technique that the printers had in the Jagger uh, shop that has also the actors' names by which they mean here actually the characters in the fiction, which are arranged by uh, gender and social standing. So this is an example of something that happened probably in intensely in the 19th century, but has carried on for quite some time. So it's a way of persons or libraries, museums, having some part of one of the folios. This third case brings us to the first folio of 1623. The Spencer Library does not itself have a copy of that, but we have this remarkable photographic facsimile, uh, which was done by the late professor Charlton Henman in the 1960s when he was a member of the KU English Department. And he made this photographic facsimile by consulting numerous copies of the folio found in the Folger Shakespeare Library. It's quite a remarkable document. And it has what has become the iconic title page which is the portrait of uh, Shakespeare. Uh, as far as we can determine, uh, it seems to be reasonably accurate. Martin Drauschett was the engraver of this portrait, and it carries on through the other folios in the 17th century. And it announces the book as being Master William Shakespeare's Comedies, Histories, and Tragedies. Not yet saying it works, but they have suggested that what becomes the order of the folio. That is, we start with comedies, histories, and then tragedies. It's a beautiful thing. There's several different settings of this engraving, but this is a wonderful example in the title page. And we have a catalog of the several comedies, histories, and tragedies, as you'll see the ones here. They're all here except um, Charles and Cressida, which is in the folio, but not listed. And that's some fluke of the, of the printing process. And there are a couple of plays missing, such as Pericles, that will eventually be added to the canon. I'm interested also in the names of the principal actors. So we make the connection between the theater and the writer as uh, 
the actors Henry and Condell had done. And it begins with William Shakespeare, then Richard Burbage, there's John Hemming, and further down the list, Henry Condell. These were the actors of the King's Men, an acting company taken under royal protection when James became King James I of England. There are two documents that form part of the prefatory material. Uh, the first is the epistle dedicatory to the Herbert brothers, and we have a copy posted on the wall here as well. It's dedicated to William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke, and his brother Philip Herbert, Earl of Montgomery. And the opening part tells us something about their accomplishments. William Herbert is Lord Chamberlain, Earl of Montgomery is the gentleman of his master's uh, bedchamber, so both uh, ones who have received the Order of the Garter, etc. And, and what uh, Heyman and Condell are trying to accomplish is to connect themselves with the system of aristocratic patronage and to acknowledge that the Herbert brothers had been friends of Shakespeare and friends of the theater. So that's one of the reasons. And they're also, of course, of enormous importance in their social political status. And him and Condell say that they're doing this and they're consecrating, that's their term, they're consecrating these texts to the Herbert brothers. And then, of course, the address to the readers, which, as our title suggests, to the great variety of readers. You'll notice that the font changes, all kinds of changes to distinguish these two introductory prefatory documents. And him and Condell here change the tone completely. And the, the opening part of the address to the readers is to buy the book. It's a one sentence, buy this book. <laughs> so it's a great marketing skill, a little uh, uh, bold. But, uh, you know, if you're going to make a success of this folio, somebody has to, has to buy it. They also talk about how the, all the plays that, that are in this text have, first of all, gained approbation in the theater itself. Well, these are two actors speaking, of course. They talk a little bit about their own uh, process of gathering the materials, and then they create a romantic image of Shakespeare, who wrote flawlessly and perfectly and never had to revise. And I don't know many people actually believe that. But, but they say at the end of it, we must read Shakespeare again and again, and if we do not do that, we're in manifest danger of not understanding him. It's a wonderful way in which they end their plea because this is a reading text which they are constructing and have put together. We may infer that the first folio, despite its expense, um, was successful in some way because nine years later we have the second folio, 1632. And this is a copy here in the Spencer collection. The same title page, it's uh, Thomas Coates is now the printer. He had been an apprentice in the Jagger print shop, so there's an interesting connection there. Uh, it's basically a kind of page-by-page -page reprint of the first folio, uh, with the addition of adding Charles and Cressa in the list of plays. Uh, one of the unique features of this second folio, 32, is uh, John Milton's first poem is published uh, in this volume. It's not, it does not have his name on it, but we know that it is because later it's included in Milton's works in about 1645. Uh, this is his earliest attempt at writing, or earliest published attempt, I should say. And Milton was a great uh, enthusiast for the theater. In fact, we have a copy of Milton's annotations to the first folio, which is in the Free Library in Philadelphia. We see here the catalog, of, uh, and again, the same sort of title page. And the catalog is opposite the first text, which is the Tempest. We have no idea why the Tempest is the first item in the folio, but so it is. Um, one curiosity here in this text, which shows us something about uh, printing error, of which there were many errors in the printing, and what happens if somebody reads it and tries to correct it. And in the second folio, uh, in the text of the first part of Henry VI, for some reason in the header or running title, it says the second part of King Henry VI. 
but of course it is the first. And someone, what looks like a contemporary hand of the 17th century, has crossed it out and written first. So we find in a number of folio copies where readers have come in and made corrections or annotations. And one of the annotators of the second folio was uh, King Charles I. And he made minor uh, annotations. While he was in prison, he called for the copy of the second folio, was brought to him, and he read it, of course, and began to make some notations about some of the characters. That uh, copy remains in the Royal Collection at Windsor, as you might imagine. There's one interesting thing happened, generated clearly by the second folio, and as a book called History of Mastics, written by William Prynne. Prynne was trained as a barrister at Lincoln's End, that is a lawyer, but he seems to have exercised most of his energy uh, in attacking the theater. So we have a 500-page book here <laughs> uh, in which he attacks the theater relentlessly. And in his address to the Christian reader, in the margins and in the text, as shown here in the exhibit case, he re reacts to the fact that these plays, such as Shakespeare's plays, are now assuming folio format which he finds an outrage, and that the paper they're being printed on is better than some Bibles. So he has a whole list of <laughs> things that annoy him about the theater, <laughs> and this is one of them. And it's clearly prompted by the publication of this second folio. The last case shows us something about imitators, successors, we might call it, to the Shakespeare folios. There were, I hasten to add, four different folio printings in the 17th century. This is uh, instead an enormous book, uh, hundreds of pages, 50-something plays. This is the plays of Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher. Uh, Fletcher actually co collaborated with Shakespeare on two plays and became the principal dramatist of The King's Men once Shakespeare retired from active writing. Uh, 1647, there was a folio edition of the plays of Beaumont and Fletcher, who had become very popular in the public uh, imagination. This is the folio of 1679, which is in the, the Spencer collection. Opposite, we have a portrait of John Fletcher. They seem never to be able to find an image of Beaumont for some reason, which is very curious. Uh, this particular folio adds 18 more plays, so this is an enormous volume. And we have here the usual sort of catalog, which is a contents page, of all the plays that are here. And the printer has put a star opposite the title of a play that is being printed for the first time in the folio. That is, was missing in the 1647 folio. And two of those plays are The Woman's Prize, which we have here reproduced part of the title page. The Woman's Prize is Fletcher's play, Holy by Fletcher, first published in 1613, but for some reason not in the 1647 folio, but here. And it is a retelling of the story of the Taming of the Shrew. And someone, presumably a, a 17th, maybe 18th century hand, has come in and written here, making the connection to Shakespeare's play, The Taming of the Shrew. And what Fletcher's done is turn all that upside down, and the women become the powerful ones. Similarly, a page from The Night of the Burning Pestle, a play wholly by Beaumont, they have many of these plays in which Fletcher and Beaumont and others are collaborating. The Night of the Burning Pestle, a comedy from the early part of the 17th century, one of the most amusing comedies that I know anything about. And here is, again, part of that. There's a brief address to the readers of the comedy prologue, the actors' names, and then someone has inscribed here, again, probably an 18th century hand, that the prologue is taken from an earlier play by John Lilly, which is, of course, true. So we have, again, another example of how readers might react to folios. And many of them felt perfectly 
comfortable writing in the folio. We're a little horrified by that now, and librarians don't let you do that. But, but if you own the thing, you can do it with it, whatever you want to. There have been studies of the marginalia and, and annotations that many readers have put in it. So this concludes the, the exhibit in terms of the items here. I underscore that all of these items come out of the Spencer Library which is a reminder of the remarkable resources that are available in this library. And with the publishing of the first folio and all the things that follow from that, Shakespeare's reputation is clearly established. And the character or motto in Shakespeare's Love's Labor's Loss desires to write, and he says he wants to write whole volumes in folio. And I would suggest that is exactly what Shakespeare has done. Perhaps no better characterization of Shakespeare could be had other than the ones made by Ben Jonson in a longish poem that is included in the first folio, in which Jonson says that Shakespeare was not of an age, but for all time. Thank you. <laughs>